Hi everyone, welcome back to the Internet's Talk Show. It's WatchHollywood.tv. I'm Frank Moran. Today we're talking about the mission to Mars, the Mars One Expedition. I'm joined by Dr. Norbert Kraft, as well as one of the potential candidates there, Quorum Ellis, coming to us all the way from Australia. Quorum, how are you doing today? I'm uh, fantastic, thank you. It's a little bit early here. It's uh, 3.30 a.m. local time in Australia. Oh, man. Now, I have to mention, this is pretty similar to how you're talking to Nor Dr. Kraft on a regular basis, it's through Skype like this. So, pretty much business as usual. <laughs> Absolutely. We won't have uh, so much back and forth, though. There'll be a little bit of a delay. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, Corp, what made you decide to get, become involved in the Mars One expedition? Yeah, great question. So, I've been very, very interested in the development of space travel and the potential that in my lifetime I might get the opportunity to see humans establish a settlement outside of our atmosphere. So I've always been plugged into that sort of information stream and, and watching how technology is developed and trends developed and, and just staying sort of plugged into those ideas. And then when Baz established this program in 2011, I was uh, became immediately aware of it and was very interested in contributing any way I could. Uh, just so it turns out that I might be able to contribute as uh, part of the human cargo to Mars. <laughs> So now when you decided to apply, do you share that with friends and family? Do, were they already aware of your interest in doing something like this, or did this kind of take them by surprise? No, it was, uh, a few friends were already aware. It was actually a friend that uh, put me in contact uh, with the, the program uh, that heard about it before me and, and made me aware of it. Uh, so I've got a nice, uh, a close-knit group of friends, and they brought it to my attention, which was fantastic. But I perhaps don't have as many family ties as some of the other candidates with children and partners. Uh, so there's a, a, a few less things for me to sever there in that department. <laughs> <laughs> so now, Dr. Kraft, you get Quorum's application. What what makes him sort of stand out as as a potential candidate? Well, actually, I can't <laughs> answer that question. I cannot answer specifically for participants. Sure. But in general, uh, what what we are looking for in, in the first part, what we, what I was looking for is. Are they really interested in it? Do they know what they're applying for? If they're just saying, oh, do I go to Mars or Moon? Then I say, hey, you're the wrong candidate. And if they um, actually filled it out correctly, or if they, um, how do you say, you go to an interview and you dress up nicely normally mm -hmm. and not just laying in a pyjama in bed. So I think he's not serious because he doesn't take it as a serious interview. He's just bored and say, oh, no, today I applied for Mars. And that's why people ask, why do we ask for an application fee, for example? And I said, this is just that we don't get, I don't know, a couple of thousand who just push the button out of fun. Right. They say, if you really want, then a couple of bucks, it's not much. It didn't make us rich or anything. It's just to give the first hurdle to really want to apply or not. And, and, and so far, he did well. He did uh, bring back the medical certificate, which was important. And uh, a lot of our applicants had to send it in. Some of them, from my point of view, I was happy I gave it to them because they found out they had cancer, or they found out they had illness and operations and they didn't know about. So I think this is important and you have to do it for every space agency. And I hear the complaints, some of that, oh, why do we have to do it? I said, any time before you apply to NASA or ESA, you have to send this in. Mm -hmm. So it's not something, you, we need healthy people. You, want, you don't want to be dragged through the program and then figure out you're sick, you can't go. Then you waste your time and you waste our time. That doesn't make sense. So, and then he sent it in and I was totally okay, so we are getting to the next step, the interview. Oh, fantastic. So, Corm, uh, when you find out that it's an open application process, that get you excited about it, applying? Definitely. I like that style of open source contribution. Uh, you know, we can see it a lot popping up in all sorts of different things with education, uh, with software development now, and uh, that type of mentality where uh, the Mars One project is just open for anyone that can contribute to contribute. is It's a fantastic way of trying to pull together resources uh, in, instead of some sort of local bias with a government agenda or something like that, which is how a lot of space development has been done in the past. This way of doing things completely commercially without borders, I think it's really nice. It's a nice way to make it a human project, as you've titled your, your show, The Human Mission. It really is. It's completely borderless. It's not. Uh, there's no particular backing from any group or organization in the world. It's just for the people of Earth to bring together all the energies and knowledge they can to make this happen, which is how it really needs to be for, for space exploration. We can't be doing it 
with that divided mentality, it needs to be a, a human expedition. Ex and exhibition. <laughs> That's true. There you go. Yeah, we'll be watching everything. So yes, you're right. A bit of an exhibitionist. Yeah. Now, while you have not trained to ever to be an astronaut, what do you think you're bringing to the table? Though, what kind of skills are you bringing into the Mars One process, and what are you looking to uh, to learn uh, while you're there? The hard question. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So that's a very good point. That anybody involved in this program is going to need to do a lot of preparation. But this is a, a set of conditions that nobody has experienced before. So there's no one we can talk to and say, hey, you know, how was it? What, how can we prepare? What can we do to be ready for this? Because it's a completely experimental zone and, and for these people to spend, you know, potentially the rest of their lives in this very awkward to inhabit zone, it's, uh, it's going to be a, a remarkable experience to prepare for. We do have a good bit of time between now and the proposed launch shape, which is amazing. My personal specialties, uh, I work very closely in the field of microhorticulture, so I'm good at growing food, <laughs> which is going to be a very, very important component for the people on Mars to help recycle air and to recycle everything they have on hand to be able to produce for themselves. Uh, I've been working in the field of vehicle electronics for a long time as well, so very handy with all sorts of uh, manipulating different components in, in mobile vehicles. So uh, hopefully I can transfer a lot of those skills that I've spent in the last 10 or so years across to this program and of course learn much, much more uh, over the next eight years. Uh, a lot to do with coexisting in small environments with other people. I think it's going to be a very important part of what everybody will have to learn to deal with. And of course the the broader things for transit, like uh, coping with the stresses of you know, rocket acceleration, uh, the time that we might need to spend in space and zero gravity and then microgravity on the surface of, of Mars. So there's, there's lots and lots we need to prepare for, but I'm sure the, the candidates as they enter the program and it becomes more advanced are in very, very good hands and uh, Norbert and the other people involved are going to make sure that we're as prepared as possible to be able to deal with the risks and challenges that we're ultimately facing. Now, Dr. Kraft, part of the process while they're training is they're going to be filmed for a reality show during this process. Now, I'm just wondering, the actual filming of a reality show during the process, do you worry that that, just the act of you filming somebody for a reality show is going to change the way people behave with that camera documented to them? Or is that something that once they, they've been around that camera for a while, they're going to be able to still drop all those kind of filters that they have? Uh, let me first make a comment that people have the wrong taste of reality show. Mm -hmm. So if you come up with reality show, they think, okay, they step each other in the back until one is left. This is not at all in our case. So we have the group in a healthy competition, and I like to more compare like sport events, where two baseball clubs um, um, try to move on, and the others can't move on as fast, and the others, some will win, and the others are not as good. And they don't step each other in the back, hopefully, in their own team. Because in our case, they would be immediately eliminated. Mm -hmm. But yes, so the cameras for them, I had my own experience in the isolation, that's what I talk about. After the first, second day, you just forget it. Sometimes you realize it when it moves and makes a noise. So we have to be careful it doesn't make a noise. Mm -hmm. But in general, you really forget. And, and I saw it with the, the astronauts and Russian cosmonauts inside, too. They really forgot it, too. And otherwise, they wouldn't have done couple of not so good things basically so really you forget it very quickly so I don't worry about that much that they change their behavior actually